You are live on YouTube. So we will wait a couple of minutes to uh, let more participants enter. Michelle, maybe you can tell me when uh, we can start. All right, so I think we can start. Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening. My name is Alain Pagani from the German Research Center of Artificial Intelligence. And I'm happy to welcome you to this uh, ISMA 2021 session number 11 on tracking and prediction. So today we have a nice program with uh, five papers to be presented. Uh, the authors, uh, you can see them already on the screen. Um, but before we start, I would like to make a number of uh, announcements or explain how the session will, uh, will um, happen. Um, the first thing is that we are in a Zoom interactive session. So um, when an author is presenting, you feel, please uh, feel free to uh, post questions uh, using the Zoom uh, question and answer feature. So if you post questions, I uh, will see them in the chat and I will be able to select them uh, after the presentation. But also you can post questions on Discord if you like, uh, and they will be also uh, redirected to, um, to the Zoom. Um, I would like also to remind uh, the attendees that um, we have an individual Discord channel uh, for uh, this session. So if you go to the Discord uh, of uh, Ismar, you will find uh, the session 11, the uh, tracking and prediction. And there is one specific channel for each paper. So you can actually use this channel today, tomorrow, or uh, even later to discuss uh, your ideas with the paper authors. Uh, this session is also uh, streamed uh, live on YouTube. So if you are watching us uh, on our YouTube, you are not able to send um, any questions, it's not interactive. But I would like to remind you that it's not too late to register to Ismar if you want to enjoy all the interactive elements. You can still register over the website, um, maybe not for this session, but uh, for, for tomorrow. We also have, uh, we are present on social media. So uh, please, uh, if you want to advertise for this uh, conference, um, you can post on your favorite uh, social networking or social media. Uh, please put a hashtag um, ismar 21 so that we can collect all the nice postings or you can reference uh, to the ISMAR conference by using uh, the uh, ISMAR count tag. Now, uh, we, we are about to start. One thing I want to remind you is that um, after the session, there will be an interactive session in Gazatown. So we have uh, question and answering rooms dedicated for uh, each session. So here we are in the session A, so there will be, uh, you will have to go to the room A and if you want to discuss with a specific author, you will go to the room number that uh, is um, the paper number in the session. So room A1 for the first um, presenters and um, so on until room A5. So this was uh, the announcement I wanted, wanted to do. So now I would like to introduce the first uh, author. 
this is uh, Jun Chiao Chen. He's uh, from the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. And he's going to present uh, his work uh, entitled Simulating Realistic Human Motion Trajectories of Mid-Air Gestures Typing. So please, Jun Chiao, the stage is yours. I think you are muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much um, for your introduction, and thank you all very much for 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 coming and your attendance. Um, so first of all, um, I'm going to today. I'm going to present our work on simulating realistic human motion trajectories of media gesture typing. Um, the structure overview is the following. You will have motivation, overview, related work, methods, evaluation, future work, and conclusion. Um, human motion analysis and simulation is a popular research topic in the augmented reality and the virtual reality community due to its very varied potential applications, such as real-time avatar animation and control, smooth human robot interaction, sports training and analysis. In the design and development of these different applications, multiple experience or extensive data collection activities are usually required to, for either the validation of the prototypes or the training of deep learning based systems. So we start the investigation of human motion simulation by examining low dimensional data. In this paper, we specifically explore the trajectories of the index fingertip artic articulating word patterns on the middle gesture keyboard. So two important scenarios for just keyboard design invoke a need for synthetic data. So first, mid-air keyboard layout design optimization faces challenging optimization problem in terms of determining different keyboard parameters, such as keyboard size, key size, distance between keys, et cetera. These parameters can vary greatly in mid-air and considering the potential enormous parameter space to search for an optimized design strategy extensive user experiments are usually required. Secondly, developing a neural network based gesture keyboard recognition model for a media keyboard uh, for media optical C3 area gesture keyboard is also a significant undertaking. However, deep learning based models require a large amount of training data to generalize. Otherwise, there is a high risk of overfitting reducing the performance. Computational simulation of human motion data is one potential way to efficiently tackle the two above tasks. For the first one, it can reduce the number of prototypes required and thereby speeding up the design process while reducing costs. It also has the potential to fully automate the design process and revolutionize experimental based decision making. And for the second one, the neural network based um, recognition model, synthesizing new data can efficiently increase the amount of training data for the deep learning based models. Um, generating realistic uh, finger trajectories is very challenging and we propose and explore four data synthesis approaches that can generate four types of synthetic trajectories with different properties. First, jerk minimization model. Second, recurrent neural network model. Um, third, GAN-based generative model in the transfer setting where the, trans where the style is transferred from the original trajectories to trajectories that simply connect the key centers for the corresponding phrases. And lastly, gain based generative model in the imitation setting, where the style is transferred within the original data set, such that different variants of the original trajectories are produced. The figure above shows that the example traces for the phrase I talk to Darren. Trace start is shown by the blue X, and the trace transitions through the green and the finish, finish the, the yellow. The, right. And then um, now we are in the race to work. Um, handwriting synthesis, which is the generation of handwriting for a given text, is a very popular research area for human motion simulation. Simulation of gesture trajectories has also been synthesized to augment training data for deep learning based gesture keyboard decoders. And the other direction of human motion simulation is a biological model based approach, which incorporates mass models and other biological considerations. The diverse behaviors of human locomotion can be generated with a complex neuromuscular gait model. 
kinetic theory related to rapid human movements was leveraged by Lavoitel to produce synthesized strokes, gestures that hold the same statistical characteristics as human generated gestures. So, um, Jack memorization model um, is a deterministic model and is optimized by op minimizing the higher order derivatives along the trajectories. It requires human intervention to fine tune the parameters of the model in order to generate realistic trajectories. And then recurrent neural network based generated model is a generated model that um, uses a mixed data set of real data and data generated from the jerk minim minimization model that was mentioned above um, to st stabilize the convergence of the model, considering the model itself is quite hard to train. Um, so this is um, one important technical innovation on the method that we used and also was, was leveraged by, it was used by Alex Graves to faci facilitate training despite using only one tenth of the amount of data. Um, um, certainly, the generative versal network based model. So we used a gain structure similar to cycle gain for an unpaired trajectory to generate style transfer. As you can see in the figure, that um, um, before transfer and after transfer. The, GAN tra the other um, gain based model is the gain um, imitation. So the gain imitation basically um, is adapted from Shane TL and modified to synthesize fingertip gesture trajectories as opposed to hand gestures. So the gain transfer model is a further novel modification which enables synthesis of new gesture trajectories for which there is no raw user data. Um, now we evaluate uh, the characteristics of the different approaches here to assess the ability of the synthesized trajectories to approximate real user traces. We compare their low level features by examining a set of geometric uh, micrometrics. These micrometrics are adapted from Yaga ETL who originally used them to characterize handwriting trajectories. This assessment serves in part to determine whether the generative model can replicate human-like features in the trace. The micrometrics are computed in a vicinity as illustrated in the figure. A vicinity is the bounding box which contains the preceding and the succeeding points. Um, the micrometrics introduced previously are chosen to characterize how closely the synthesized trajectory reflect human-like behaviors. There are several um, qualities observable in the synthetic data indicating good alignment with the behaviors and the features present in real human trajectories. In the second plot, we can see that for all the micrometrics, it is gain transfer trajectory that shows the closest KL divergence distance to the real trajectories. Therefore, if design automation is a purpose, gain transfer is most desired as it not only has the smallest KL divergence on those micrometrics, but also it, is, it can also condition on arbitrary keyboard layouts and phrases. The jerk minimization model and the RM based model are a very good choice to start with as well, things they can all generate trajectories according to arbitrary keyboard layout and phrases. Um, another thing that we write is to do visualization through dimensional um, dimensionality reduction um, that can make high dimensional data easier to interpret. The figure here shows that the gain based trajectories lie closest to original data set in the latent space. And this suggests that the model may perform well in training deep neural networks, since deep neural networks first extract latent features from the data and then perform recognition by outputting the prob probability distribution of the outputs based on those latent features. Um, now we have demonstrated the potential of using state of the art generated models to synthesize realistic lower dimensional human motion trajectories. There are many higher dimensional human motion trajectories involving, for example, spatial in, in information that are also suitable for this treatment. Variants of high dimensional trajectories can be produced from the imaginative game since it enables the data to transfer style internally. Um, and lastly, um, you can also uh, automate the aspects of media adjusted keyboard design by exploiting vision optimization and then comparing the performance of the three approaches. Um, so in summary, we have proposed and explored four approaches for generating synthetic trajectory that are suitable for different scenarios. Um, the different approaches um, produce trajectory that exhibit 
distinct characteristics and unique properties, which can be explored depending on the specific design problems at hand. Um, we include the accuracy, latent space distance, condition on arbitrary keyboard layout, condition on arbitrary phrases, and obviously the optimization time. For example, for design optimization, direct minimization may be the preferred choice option since the option since the model easily adapts to new layouts and can generate traces for unseen phrases. And if you want to train a neural deep, neural deep learning based recognition model, then maybe the GAN um, imputation or the GAN transfer models are preferable since they exhibit a closer latent space distribution to real data. Overall, GAN transfer demonstrates well-rounded properties across all evaluation metrics, including accuracy, latent space, distance, um, or the other characteristics. And we anticipate that these different approaches to simulating realistic human motion trajectories will provide a very useful tool in advancing the state of the art of media gesture typing in augmented and re virtual reality. Uh, for more, more details about the structures and about the evaluation, and also um, for the detailed code on, of the repository of the models, um, please refer to the paper. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for your nice presentation, uh, Junqiao. Um, now uh, we have some time uh, for questions. So um, you can either put your questions in the chat if you have some. Um, there is also the option to raise your hand in the, in the Zoom. Um, if there is any raised hand, uh, we'll see it. But maybe I will ask you with uh, uh, start with one question. So um, you presented a method for generating simulated gestures. So um, what would be an application of the of the, the gestures that you have simulated? So to to train yet another network uh, to detect the, the features, or what are the uh, typical applications? All right. Uh, thank you very much for your question. That it was a very nice question. So, um, as I mentioned, there are two potential, uh, a big potential um, research problem that needs to be solved. So, first of all, we need to train a deep learning based uh, recognition model to recognize the gestures. Because in um, in gesture keyboard, you need to decode the gestures into text. And now, um, people use state of art uh, recognition models to to map the gesture traces to text and we need a large amount of data and simulating those kind of data is very important here. And uh, that's the first um, um, challenge that can be solved by simulating the real uh, human motion simulations. Um, the sec second challenge is also, as I also mentioned is that uh, when people would want to build prototypes within AR um, or they want, to do, they want to optimize the design, um, and this kind of design process usually requires um, a different iteration of the prototypes and a different iteration of user experience. And what if we can um, simulate those realistic human motion trajectories so that there will be no longer user experience that are needed for this kind of um, uh, design problems. So I think human motion simulation is a very um, good angle to tackle the two problems. And in my specific case, I think that um, generating um, realistic um, uh, index finger-based trajectories can um, both can both solve the deep learning-based recognition model and also the uh, keyboard design optimization problem. As the keyboard in midair can have different kind of aspiration and lens and um, and different kind of shapes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm looking uh, in the question and answer uh, of Zoom. Uh, I don't see any other question in the chat. All right, then uh, let's thank uh, our presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We can uh, switch uh, to the next presenter. So uh, this is uh, Rifatul Islam. So maybe you can start sharing your screen. So Rifatul Islam is a PhD candidate at uh, the Department of Computer Science the University of Texas in San Antonio, and is doing research on personalized VR frameworks to reduce users' discomfort. And today is presenting a, his paper entitled Cyber Sickness Prediction from Integrated HMD Sensors 
a multimodal deep fusion approach using eye tracking and head tracking data. So if at all, you can start the presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you everyone. That was a nice introduction. Uh, um, as I already know my name, I'm Rifatul and I'm gonna be presenting our work today. So let's get started with that. Uh, so as you already know, uh, like in virtual reality specifically, uh, there's a discomfort associated with virtual reality that we usually call cyber sickness. Uh, it is something like a motion sickness, like kind of symptoms, you might get nausea or you might get disorientation and there's a lot into that. So up until now, um, usually what researchers do is they ask some post uh, immersive questionnaire like the uh, simulator sickness questionnaire or something like that to measure the um, to measure the severity of cyber sickness. Now the problem with the traditional approach here is uh, when you asking questions after the immersion is completed, um, then you cannot really do anything about it. So you already started feeling cyber sick. Um, there's nothing much can do because the effect of cyber sickness can be last from one hour to even a couple of days. Um, so to solve this problem um, recently, there's a lot of research in real time cyber sickness predictions. So if we can real time in during the immersion, we can predict the onset of cyber sickness, then there's a chance that we can apply some well-known reduction techniques to mitigate the effect of cyber sickness. So our paper does exactly um, the similar research we proposed and um, novel approach to predict the cyber sickness uh, with an accuracy of 87.7% using only eye tracking and head tracking data. So that was an introduction. Um, so the next question is, so if you right now search on Google Scholar, um, you'll find more than probably 3000 uh, paper or recent works related to cyber sickness predictions. So uh, why do we need another model? So uh, there's so much to this uh, research. Why do we need another prediction model to predict the onset of cyber sickness in real time? Uh, so if you look into the traditional cyber sickness uh, prediction methodology, you'll find out that um, usually what uh, the researcher do is they attach some sensors to the participant's body, and then uh, there is a simulation or a couple of simulations, and during the simulation, they collect those physiological data and later analyze those physiological data or propose deep neural network architecture to detect the onset of cyber sickness. Now, the problem with that is that um, the consumer level VR experience is not only limited in seated conditions. So in typical VR experience, you want to do different type of locomotions, you want to do different type of 3D object manipulations, you want to be free yourself and do all those different kinds of activities that you want to do. Um, since you attach those physiological sensors, for example, if you attach EEG and hardware sensor, most of the cases it will get corrupted by sudden motions. So due to avoid uh, any kind of external noise, um, usually we do see that VR experience in cyber sickness uh, prediction. So that is at all not realistic with the consumer level VR that we wanna put more focus in. So this is why we need to uh, put more focus on the sensors that is integrated within the head mounted displays. So in typical modern head mounted display, we get uh, head tracking, we get um, a stereoscopic video image data from the, uh, from the head mounted display. We can also get eye tracking data. And not to mention like the recent one from um, HP, they also include uh, like heart rate sensor and facial expression um, data, you can get to all those different kinds of data from the head mount display. So in our, our motivation towards that is this prediction model that 
can allow all those three different types of locomotion and that is being realistic to consumer level VR. And we also want to focus on different uh, points when we actually design this model is it is it should be easy to integrate with the current uh, head mounted display and it can have a, a like potential to later apply as a real time cyber sickness reduction model too. So uh, towards that we proposed our model. Um, we only use the sensor that is uh, integrated within the head monitor display. So for example, we only uh, use the eye tracking data, head tracking data, and the video data. Um, and then we proposed a multimodal deep neural network. Each one of those network learn their own features. And um, later we do some deep fusion analysis on them and then finally predict the onset of cyber sickness. Um, now our model or the approach here is different. Um, it does allow different type of locomotion, does allow different type of 3D object manipulation and seated standing and walking VR experience. So let's get a little bit more into that. So we designed uh, five different type of VR simulations uh, based on those four conditions. So different type of locomotions, whether you can walk or do teleportation, uh, use of controllers, which controllers you are using, uh, what was the experience, are you um, being seated or it is room scaled, and what was your motion perceptions? Is the motion is controlled by you or the motion is simulated or not? And each one of those VR simulation was approximately seven minutes long up until uh, if the user decided to quit earlier, they can also do that. And they were like um, in counterbalanced order. Um, for the participants, we recruited 15 male participants and 15 female participants with different racial background. And um, the mean age was 29.4 years. Here's an example of those uh, simulations, different simulations. So for the uh, study, we use HTC Vive uh, Pro and um, to allow free locomotions, we also um, use HTC Vive wireless adapter. Uh, for the data collections, we designed a custom log API for the HTC Vive Pro that can simultaneously take those eye tracking, head tracking, and stereo image data without blocking the main VR. Um, and to construct, basically construct a ground truth, we use the fast motion scale, uh, which is in short called the FM score. Uh, basically, in a lighted form, you ask the person to read their discomfort. Um, so this is all the apparatus that we used. And this is the architecture of the uh, overall diffusion network. Um, so we use two different types of network. One is the 3D CNN model for the stereoscopic image data. And the another one is CNN LSTM model for the time series data. So depending on how we uh, fuse our different modalities, uh, we combine them together. And then finally, uh, using a left fusion layer, we, uh, finally predict the onset of cyber sickness. Now for the results, we did two different kinds of results. One is classification of the cyber sickness severity based on the predicted FMS score. And another one is the repression of the FMS score. So uh, different, uh, based on different types of um, fast motion scale score, we basically categorize them in four different classes, whether it is uh, none or low cyber sickness, medium cyber sickness, or high level of cyber sickness. And within those uh, uh, like different type of fusing modalities, we found out that using eye tracking, head tracking data, uh, we can achieve an accuracy of 87.7%. And in all the other uh, parameters like precision and recall, the eye tracking, head tracking data has a higher accuracy than the other ones. Uh, same is true for the regression. Uh, using eye tracking, head tracking data, we had better results. For example, in here, we had a very low uh, R square value, a, a very high R square value and very low um, error on the eye tracking, head tracking data. Now, uh, to summarize everything, the work is promising in a sense that uh, it doesn't have to rely on any kind of external sensor to predict the onset of cyber sickness um, with a very good accuracy. Um, so in order to uh, later, if 
to do any kind of integration of this uh, work to commercial VR headset, it will have it will not have to rely on any kind of external sensors. Although there are some limitations, like for the stroscopic image data, um, we could not achieve higher accuracy. So for example, here is a, a misclassification example. So when the actual class was medium, the model predicted high. Uh, so in order to fix those, we need to put more focus on uh, how we can actually develop deep neural network model, um, particularly on for those uh, stereoscopic image data. And that's basically our future goal is going to be. So that concludes our uh, presentation today. And here's my basic information. And I'm also looking for jobs. So just hit me up if anything, if you want to talk to me or if you have any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric Latoul. Uh, again, uh, please, you can ask your questions now. Uh, you have uh, either the question and answer mode in uh, Zoom. You can put your question in the chat. Um, just opening the chat to look at the chat. Um, or you can raise your hand. Don't be shy. Uh, it's an interactive session. Um, just looking at the chat now. Um, but I'm I'm a curious person. I have I have questions, and I have actually already two questions for you. Um, the, the first one is what, what surprised me is that apparently the result that you showed shows that less is more, because you could achieve good results with eye tracking and head uh, tracking, but if you add video, then it, it's less good. Then I was a little bit surprised by that. Or did I miss something in, in your results when you try different modes? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that also, also, also surprised us. Like uh, when we fused those with the stereoscopic image data, we expected it to be more accurate uh, because it, the more information coming from different modalities, we expect it to be more accurate. But for some reason, either it could be, uh, so the clips are like 30 seconds each. So it could be there were like no temporal relationship uh, between those uh, part seconds clip, or it could be the model could not learn those internal feature, um, or there is no specific relationship to those particular video clip or the data that we are getting from those uh, particular video clips, like optical flow or disparity. Uh, there is no strong relationship with those in respect to cyber sickness. So there could be a lot of different potentials of, uh, with respect to that video data. But for eye tracking, head tracking data, we actually did, if you go look into the paper, we actually did some analysis and we found a strong correlations, specifically for eye tracking data. So when the participants were sick, they were like gazing all over the screen. So there's a like a strong correlation. But when the participant was not sick, they were like more focused on the job or the task that they were doing. So we need to do more future work with respect to those specific stereoscopic image data. Yeah, all right. Um, so maybe also the, the networks get confused with so much information and maybe the yeah. direct video uh, is not correlated because it's totally depending on the surroundings and, and, the, and uh, the content of the video. No, okay. Um, still looking at the questions, uh, we have no open question in the Q&A, but uh, then I would like to ask my second question. <laughs> and which yeah, is, sure. um, so I'm not an expert of that, but I've uh, heard that uh, cyber sickness is quite uh, human dependent. So you have some people very affected by that, some not. So did you uh, try to split your, your uh, users into groups or checking if there is uh, more correlation when people know that they are actually uh, affected by that? That's actually a really good question. So for this study, no, we did not group them like individually, but we are uh, getting ready um, for a future study where we're going to do basically individualization of the cyber sickness prediction. So basically, I'm quite agree with you, like cyber sickness is highly personalized thing. It may happen to someone differently than other person. So what we basically need to do is train a model on some general population and then use transfer learning to basically individualize them per person. 
So that's that's a good question. For this study, we have not addressed them, but for future work, definitely it needs to be done to in order to personalize the uh, virtual reality cybersickness predictions. All right, thank you. Uh, looking at the questions, I don't see any other question yet. No raised hand. So uh, thank you, Rifatul, once again. Thank you. Uh, and let's uh, move to our next speaker. And this is uh, Lucas Maximilian uh, Mazopoulos. Hello. Uh, so Lucas is a PhD student from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of, University of California, Davis. And he is interested in uh, extended reality, information visualization and visual design. And today he will present um, his paper entitled A Comparison of the Fatigue Progression of eye tracked and Motion Control Interaction in Immersive Space. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Just making sure. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, thanks again for the introduction and um, good morning or I guess good night or whatever fits the time zone. Um, and thank you all for joining my talk. Um, as you now know, my name is Lucas Maximilian. Um, I'm with Witte Labs at UC Davis, and I'll host our talk about our paper, a comparison of the fatigue progression of eye tract and motion controlled interaction immersive space. So um, what's our work about? At first, I want to give a little overview. Um, in our paper, we investigate XR interaction fatigue, which typically occurs after the extended use of an interaction method. For example, um, in control interaction, there is a phenomenon known as gorilla arm. While studies relate interaction-induced fatigue, little research actually evaluates and directly compares different interaction methods in immersive space. Um, all the while, the market and consumer-grade XR devices uh, um, are ever-growing because of the increased affordability of high-quality equipment. In contrast to earlier models, which primarily relied on controller input, many current generation devices include technology for more natural interactions. Accurate eye tracking is one of the most promising of such additions, opening new opportunities for interaction design. Um, this trend is supported by market analysis forecasts, um, which project an exponential increase in market size for eye tracking enabled XR equipment over the coming years. So for a long time, the predominant input modality in VR has been motion controls, um, such as bu seen bundled with consumer grade headsets like HTC Vive or PlayStation VR. However, the emerging market for eye tracking enabled XR devices creates a need to evaluate new and existing interaction modalities to better understand their feasibility for long-term interactions in immersive space. As I said before, prior work investigating the fatigue properties of such interaction techniques has been limited in length and often fails to draw a direct comparison between the modalities. So in our study, um, we compare the currently predominant interaction method to these emerging eye trackers. To this end, our goal is to offer a direct comparison to motion controls as the most commonly used input modality. To ensure a fair comparison, we use a standardized interaction task to put them side by side with gaze mediated input. And by comparing both techniques unique fatigue progression patterns, we derive implications for future XR interaction design. So um, to achieve this, we base our evaluation on the ISO 9241-9 selection task, where user selects targets in a circular arrangement. We then um, modify this task by reducing the number of targets and selecting them at random in an effort to increase the potential for interaction fatigue. To perform a selection with either interaction technique, the user has to point or look at the currently highlighted target and hold their pose for 500 milliseconds. Um, we chose this type of selection, which is called a dual selection for both interaction techniques to ensure comparability in our study. Positional data is collected based on where the user points on at any given time. We then periodically record the position that the user points or looks at on a target during each task. We represent these samples as seen here as a matrix across user's view and time t. 
Next, we create a temporal sliding window of about 40 seconds for each user. With that data, we then calculate the probability density function for each window and next find the maximum probability value for each PDF. The higher this value, the more accurate a user was when pointing or looking at a target. Um, note that by doing so, we discard positional information at this stage. And then to ensure comparability, we normalize each data point in the resulting matrix across windows and users. And for more details on how this pipeline exactly works, um, we please refer you to the paper. So as a setup for testing both interaction modalities, we recruited 14 participants with varying prior experience using either technique for a within subject study. And as such, each individual spent 10 minutes on each task. We used the Vario X for one headset with a 100 Hertz eye tracking module. And as per the manufacturer specification, this achieves sub-degree accuracy and a field of view of roughly 87 degrees. Naturally, as conditions, we chose a gaze selection task that we then compare against the motion controller selection task. In both conditions, users were asked to remain stationary. We further disabled head rotation in the gaze condition to avoid users tilting their heads to help them select targets. Um, both implemented a ray cast extending from the tip of the controller or the gaze of the user respectively. The dwell time for the selection task was based on prior work, which found 500 milliseconds ideal for this setting. So how did it go? Well, first let's take a look at selection accuracy. Using the raw positional data, we create the following six contour plots showing the average error along the X and the Y axis in meters. These contour plots are a representation of the probability density functions that we calculated earlier. So in the first minute, we can already see a lower peak in the gaze condition as indicated by its highest peak shown here in orange, whereas the highest peak in motion is red. That peak further decreases over time as seen in the control plots of the last minute, where now the motion condition appears um, way more accurate. If, if we now look at overall accuracy, there's a clear difference between the two conditions, indicating that eye fatigue has a more substantial influence on performance. This trend is further reflected when we look at the relative interaction performance over time. For actually making our performance relative, we take the resulting data from our processing pipeline to retrieve a time series of normalized maximum values that we define as relative performance over time. So in other words, we're taking the distribution of each shifting window, discard the positional information and only look at the raw errors that we then normalize by each user and each window. That way we essentially eliminate any bias that might have been introduced by user proficiency or a momentarily lapse in a particular, user's, a particular user's performance. We use this data from both conditions to construct a time series plot, um, which enables us to directly compare the fatigue properties of the interaction methods over time. In a graph on the right, we see a trend by taking point samples from this processing pipeline for both conditions, where um, the gaze condition is represented by blue um, and the motion condition is represented in gold. As we can gather from this plot, while gaze starts with a better relative accuracy, it drops below motion controls until minute three and a half, then rises again and finally surpasses motion controls after minute seven, only to fall back to previous levels at minute 10. To draw con conclusions from these patterns, we conduct the Granger causality test on top of our data to investigate correlations between the two fatigue curves. As most of you may know, this statistical test can help you um, reveal similarities between data points and also gives an indication of what level of shift the data aligns at, which in our case might hint at a delayed onset of fatigue in either condition. So interestingly, we found a significant correlation when we shift the curves against one another by an interval of roughly three minutes, indicating that both interaction methods behave rather similarly overall with the onset of fatigue delayed in the gaze condition. Finally, we calculate the mean throughput over time and total selection throughput, which can be seen in both plots here. The gaze interaction shows significantly higher fluctuations as shown by the wider spread on the right plot, 
in the number of targets selected, while motion controls exhibits little to no change in overall throughput. Motion control's superior long-term fatigue behavior is further reflected when we look at our quality of feedback. In the NASA TLX plot on the left, where hues of purple indicate strong disagreement and hues of orange indicate um, strong agreement, we can see that the motion condition performed significantly better when users evaluated mental demand, perceived success, or perceived frustration. On the right, we show two notable quotes from our study. For example, um, one user reported, I feel like it required more effort to consistently remain on spheres with the cursor in the eye tracking method. And um, motion tracking felt overall more accurate and less exhausting, but eye tracking has its merits for short time interaction, given that the hardware is actually precise. So what are the implications that we can derive from our study? Well, first, that gaze interaction appears to be better suited for high frequency intermittent interactions or in scenarios where using motion controls is simply unfeasible. For example, when driving a car. This goes in line with the observed shift in the onset of fatigue shown in our causality analysis. On the other hand, motion controls seem to be the safer choice when designing long-term continuous interactions, such as seen in a video game. So what does the future have? in store. First, we want to compare an even bigger number of selection techniques, such as do reticles or blink slash click to select. Second, we want to study even more extended periods and further increase the number of tasks to perform. And lastly, we want to employ even more accurate tracking equipment, while also first verifying the manufacturer's accuracy claims. And that wraps up my talk now. Um, thanks for tuning in. And I have my co-author David here, <laughs> or my co-first author David, I should say here. Um, and we're happy to take any questions. Hi. I can probably take this part. That's fine. Yeah, thank okay. you very much, uh, Lucas, Maximilian, and David. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, as uh, for the other talks, uh, please, you can ask your questions. Um, you can also raise your hand. You would be able to ask your question directly using your mic. Just checking the chat right now. Not seeing a question. I hope there is no technical failure that I cannot see the questions. Um, so yes, again, don't be shy. Um, but if no one has a question, I will have one. And um, I was actually uh, I did not totally understand what was the standardized uh, task that you you did. So um, probably it's uh, just a standard so that you can uh, you don't have any bias when comparing. But I was a little bit curious um, about your conclusion, saying that uh, the eye tracking method would uh, actually be better for smaller tasks or that uh, for a few minutes and then the motion controllers for longer ones. But there are probably also um, a correlation to the the type of tasks, uh, with, uh, depending on what feels more natural. If the virtual task is to take something and place it somewhere else, maybe naturally the people would like to take their hands. And uh, for other things, while driving, they would like to use the, the eye. So what is your experience with, with the adaptation of the motion or the controlling type to the mm -hmm. type of tasks? Or did you some, do some research on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, David, you want to take this question or me? Yeah, sure. So um, in, in our case, we wanted to, our main goal was to study the fatigue progression. So all the recommendations we give are basically um, in the context of designing applications that can be used for long-term interactions. Um, we definitely want to further investigate uh, other types of interactions for other contexts of usage. The main focus here was to study the fatigue. So um, our recommendations can be seen as a, as a way to create applications that fatigue the user um, as little as possible so that they are usable for a long, um, for a long period of time. For other tasks like that require more, more complex more, uh, cognitive load, uh, they might be different, and that's definitely worth studying. So that's definitely not future work. Yeah, 
So maybe to add on to that is um, that we use this to like create a, an equal um, measure of fatigue. Should have a big impact on things like the overall throughput. So I think like if you do a different test or like a different in like selection modality, like maybe point and click, it might be that the user is way faster. But the thing is, they still have to hold a controller in space, right? So the assumption is that um, this motion where you hold the controller is still fatiguing, just as it as it would be with any other you know interaction technique. And same goes for eye tracking. This is why we chose this as a baseline. But yeah, um, totally. Thank you for the question. We are going to study more selection and like different tasks over you know the coming years. And what are the, the next controlling uh, possibilities that you want to uh, put in your in your further studies? So you went around um, delivery, so maybe you can explain that a little bit more. Sure. So thanks for that. And I think I can take that. Yeah. So, um, I mean, first and foremost, there are more, as I said in the intro, there are more and more um, different headsets with different modalities coming up. So, for example, I think it's the H. P Omnicept that has like five different um, input modalities. And so that would be motion controls, eye tracking, cognitive load, heart rate, and facial tracking even, and um, speech to text, right? So that's, I think, even seven. Um, so it is kind of interesting to see what, you know, modality is good for which task and to see how accurate they are, how they compare to one another, um, if they are fatiguing and yeah, so I think the future is very bright in that regard. Um, as yes. for like, although I have a hard time imagining how I can control something with my own heart, uh, heart <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, yeah, I know, but like, I read an interesting paper that actually combines these measures to um, give an indication of intent. So, you know, when you look at something, it has to be an intentful interaction, right? So the way to measure this is either you say, okay, you look at something for a certain period of time, but that's kind of unintuitive. So some papers previously investigated how body measures like, you know, the sweat on your finger palms or like your heart rate or cognitive load might indicate that you actually want to look at something, whereas you just look at random somewhere. So that's like an interesting, you know, field to study in the future, I feel, to actually, you know, create better selection methods for XR. Yeah. Interesting. This opens the avenues for research. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you again. I'm looking if there are questions. Uh, there are no more questions. So, thank you. And we will uh, move uh, to the next uh, um, talk. So, uh, our ne next speaker is uh, Abhishek Tiagi. So, maybe you can start your screen. Abhishek, hello. So, um, Abhishek Tiagi is a computer vision engineer working at uh, R&D labs in Samsung Semiconductor. And he was working before that in um, the XR research group at Qualcomm. And he's interested in SLAM and uh, visual inertial holometry algorithms for AR and VR application. And today he's presenting his uh, work uh, entitled uh, DVIO, a depth aided visual inertial holometry for RGBD sensors. So welcome, Abhishek, and the stage is yours. Hi, uh, can you uh, see my screen? Yes, I do. Okay, uh, hi. Thanks, Dr. Allen, for the introduction, and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhishek Tyagi, and I will be presenting our work on depth aided visual inertial odometry system for RGBD sensor called DVI. This work has been done uh, at SOC R&D lab in Samsung Semiconductor Ring with my team members, Yang Wen Liang, Sunshan Wong and Dongwen Bei. As we all know, visual inertial odometry is a state estimation system that uses data from IMU and camera to estimate six drop pose of the body. VIO has become a critical block for many augmented reality applications, such as AR gaming, 3D reconstruction, and AR lenses. In recent years, we all have seen that there is an increased adoption of active depth sensors in mobile phones. The current modern smartphones have used sensors like IMU sensors, multiple camera sensors, as well as depth sensors. These depth sensors provide a very good estimate of the scene depth in camera frame. And this depth 
can be used to provide good constraints for the camera motion, which can be used to improve the overall performance of a VIO system. So to see the related work, uh, as you all know, uh, monocular VIO has been very well researched in uh, past time. So I'm uh, noting down a few uh, state-of-the-art systems over here. So first is Vince Mono. Vince Mono is a optimization-based VIO, which uses camera and IMU to perform the state estimation and is considered state-of-the-art. In case of VIO system that uses depth sensors, we have Vince RGBD. This is a system that was built on top of Vince Mono and it uses a depth measurement for feature state initialization. The second system that has come out recently is DUI VIO, which uses a GMM-based uncertainty model in a one-dimensional feature state to perform uh, a state estimation. In all these systems, in our experiment, we observe a higher pose error and tracking failure in challenging and long trajectory scenarios. So to improve this, in our DVIO, we have improved the performance by fully utilizing depth measurement for constraints in the optimization step. We also use depth measurement in case of unsynchronized RGBD and IMU sensor to better estimate the time offset between the two sensors. Finally, to improve the runtime performance of the overall system, we propose a block-based marginalization scheme to maintain real-time performance. In our DVIO, we use a sliding window nonlinear optimization based framework, which is very similar to the one proposed in Vince Mono. The state vector is comprised of two sections. One is the navigation test state X nav, which has IMU pose, speed, and biases for every keyframe. And second is the X feature state X feed, which has feature state vector for the 3D landmark observed in the keyframe. To do the state estimation, we perform a sliding window based uh, 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 minimize, uh, sliding window based uh, optimization method by minimizing the cost function. And the cost function has four components. First is the prior for the state from previous marginalization. And second is the IMU residue generated from IMU pre-integrate. So these two residue blocks are computed using the same strategy as explained in Vince Mono. Now the third component is a 3D vision residue, which is computed using 3D landmark estimate for the non-anchor frame using the VIO state. Over here, we use Cauchy loss function for computing the residue. The fourth component is the feature state prior residue, which is computed using the feature state estimate and the feature st uh, state measurement in the anchor frame. The 3D vision residue and the feature state prior residue is computed according to the feature state parameterization. In our system, we have shown two types of uh, feature state parameterization. First one is the one dimensional feature state parameterization. In this, the 3D landmark defined in the VIO state using inverse depth of the landmark in the first keyframe. Using the inverse depth and the 2D feature measurement in anchor frame I, we can estimate 3D measurement of the landmark in non-anchor frame J. Now, as you can think, in non-anchor frame J, we can easily, estimate, easily compute 3D vision residue using the 3D value of the landmark, both estimated and measured. In case of anchor frame I, the depth measurement from the depth map is used to compute the feature state prior residue. Now, we also show how to use a three-dimensional feature state parameterization in our DVI. Here, the landmark is defined in the VIO state using the inverse depth and the 2D feature measurement uh, of the landmark in the first keyframe it is observed. Now, uh, now again, using the 3D feature state, we can estimate the feature measurement in non-anchor frame J and compute the 3D vision residue. Whereas in anchor frame I, now we can compute a full 3D feature state prior. With this, we are able to compute uh, a complete three-dimensional uh, uh, residue for the anchor frame I. As you can see, here we are able to generate stronger constraint using three-dimensional feature state parameterization. But this also increases the overall problem size. Now to compensate for the increased problem size, we are proposing a block-based marginalization for faster processing. To give you a background on the marginalization, 
marginalization step of a VIO is a step in which we drop certain states from sliding window to maintain the size of the problem. In our system, we use the same strategy of keyframe and non-keyframe based marginalization as proposed in Vince Mono. So if we look into the uh, process of uh, marginalization of the oldest keyframe, we can easily see that the size of the information matrix to be marginalized increases with the number of landmarks. Now this problem becomes three times when we go from 1D to 3D feature parameterization and hence affects the runtime performance of the overall system. To compensate for this, in our DVIO, we have proposed a block-based marginalization, which performs marginalization of the block associated with all the landmarks, and then performs the marginalization of the block associated with post, speed, and bias of the keyframe. In case of a marginalization of the oldest keyframe, the information matrix of the marginalized state has a unique structure with a sparse and dense block. Over here in the image, the non-zero values are in yellow and zero values are in blue for our information matrix. Now in our algorithm, in case of the block associated with landmark, we have a very sparse matrix. We use this structure to efficiently marginalize the landmark from the state. In case of 1D feature state, this will be a diagonal matrix and its inverse can be easily computed. In case of the 3D feature state, each landmark has three correlated coordinates. Hence, we compute the inverse of a three by three block and marginalize each landmark one by one. Once all the landmarks are marginalized, the dense block associated with the pose, speed, and biases are marginalized. With our block-based marginalization scheme, we are able to achieve faster marginalization processing time for both 1D and 3D feature parameterization. This enables the DVIO thread to run at 10 hertz, uh, uh, 10 hertz update, allowing for a real-time performance of the overall system. In a scenario where we have unsynchronized sensors, we have time offset between RGBD sensor and IMU sensor. This time offset is considered constant but unknown. To handle this problem, we propose to add time offset as part of VIO state. And to estimate that, we first compute using the 2D feature measurement and the depth measurement, the 3D velocity of the feature in camera frame. Once we have the 3D velocity and the time offset, we can propagate the RG, um, feature measurement in the RGBD clock to IMU clock. Now we can estimate the whole system, uh, uh, whole VIO state, which also includes the time offset uh, by minimizing the cost function using nonlinear optimization technique. Here, the residue block from marginalization and IMU pre-integrate are same as in the synchronized sen sensor scenario explained before. The vision residue uh, 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 is computed using the feature measurement uh, from the propagated uh, measurement of uh, uh, propagated to the IMU clock. With this, we are able to model the time offset estimation in DVIO, which results in overall accuracy and robustness improvement of our system. Now, we have uh, tested our system over a comprehensive test data set, which includes synthetic data set, uh, handheld WINS RGB data set, and VCU RBI handheld benchmark data set. Here we present the results of, uh, of our performance, performance results for uh, VCU RBI benchmark. Now VCU RBI benchmark is an openly available RGBD sequence data set with a comprehensive test coverage. And that's why we are uh, pre presenting those results over here. You can see from the uh, test, uh, test table that our DVI system has performed best in 24 out of 27 sequences. And also if you look at the number of failures, our DVI system has least number of failures as compared to any other uh, uh, state-of-the-art system. Next, next we want to show a video uh, which is showing the performance of our system on different sequences. First, on a synthetic sequence. Here, with more accurate pose, our DVIO is able to generate very uh, superior point cloud compared to other state-of-the-art systems. Next. On the uh, VCU RBI sequences, you will see that our system is able to generate more consistent pose. Especially on the long trajectory sequences, our DVI is able to generate maintain low errors in the pose estimation, which can be seen from consistent pose of the trajectory path and also by the uh, end point of the loop.
to summarize we pre we pre hello so to summarize we presented a method to add depth from rgbd sensor in a non linear optimization based vi we have shown that the depth measurement can be used in both 1d and 3d feature parameterization moreover we proposed a method to utilize the depth measurement in the estimation of time offset for synchronized unsynchronized rgbd and imu sensors in the marginalization process we have also proposed a block based marginalization scheme which reduces the runtime significantly finally we carried out extensive experiments to show that our proposed system outperformed the state of the art in terms of reliability accuracy and runtime thank you for your attention and for more details please refer our paper well thank you very much for this very interesting presentation um i'm looking now if there are questions in the audience um looking at the chat no um all right uh, q a so please don't be shy you can also raise your hand <laughs> ask a question uh, we are a small group so um all right uh, i have i have questions for you uh, abhishek and um actually from your results you showed that uh, among the sequences that have been tested sometimes it was uh, the 1d variant that was uh, the best and sometimes the 3d so i was wondering if you have a way of finding out uh, or which one you should use because uh, obviously you have two winners <laughs> so uh, or uh, and as an additional point um, if you see a way of uh, merging the two in order to have one system that would be uh, working for all situations so um uh, that's th thanks for the question it's a really nice question um um from our rx uh, our experience what we have uh, we have noticed that uh, if you look at overall performance uh, the there is uh, there is a slight difference um, in the performance of uh, dbio 3d in scenarios where there is a longer trajectory because of the higher amount of constraint is able to maintain better pose accuracy so if you look at uh, the test uh, results uh, in the longer trajectories dbio 3d has been performing much better uh, consistently whereas in a, a smaller sequences and more agile sequences dbio 1d is able to perform uh, um, better than dbio 3d but um, having said that the overall performance is not much difference in both the two systems so um uh, i i i we we have given a thought into this as to how can we combine them together but that can definitely be a future work for how to combine these two systems together and, and come up with a more um uh, uh, scenario based uh, uh, uh parameterization but uh, um yeah um uh, uh, what we think is uh, uh, it could be a use case specific so if if we are having a large scale slam wherein we want to go on a larger trajectory we could use a dvi or 3d uh, type of a scenario and if we are uh, more interested in faster processing because obviously dbi 1d has a uh, smaller state size and because it has smaller state size the processing can be much faster than dbi 3d uh, we could go with the uh, with dbi 1d in the scenarios where we want uh, we are more interested in faster processing times thanks um still looking at possible questions um if someone has one question oh here I have one question from Andrea Macari. Uh, do you think about making the algorithm open source? Uh, uh, yes, we we have doing a uh, having a discussion internally uh, to decide on that whether whether we can make the open source uh, the code open source. This is a uh, Samsung lab, so we have to go through our internal uh, uh, approval system. But, uh, yeah, that's what we are working on right now. When do you plan to do it? Uh, I don't have an answer for that right now. Uh, okay. Whether we can make it open source or not. To keep us posted. Yes. Right. Um, great. Okay. Looking at the questions, I actually I have another question. Um, if we have a little bit of time, yes. Um, I, I, I'm quite interested by the the work you did uh, looking at the time offset between the IMU and the video data because this is a very important topic. I think that if you it's not only about calibration because I think as you said that uh, sometimes this offset is not constant and um so what is your what I missed a little bit in your presentation is uh the 
the added value of by having this time offset. So you presented uh, the entire system, but did you try to compare uh, without uh, taking into account time offset and with uh, taking it into account? Uh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the question again. And uh, uh, yes, uh, I did, we did not present these results. Uh, we did not present the comparison of with and without time offset estimation for certain, uh, for the sequences for which there was a time offset uh, uh, in be between uh, um, the uh, RGBD sensor and the IMU sensor. But uh, in our uh, experiments, we have observed that yes, when we do not have time offset estimation, the performance can be much worse as compared to when you have time offset estimation as part of the state, because obviously the model, uh, the, the error that is introduced by the not modeling time offset between the two sensors gets propagated into your uh, pose estimation. So yes, uh, that's definitely the case. If you have a time offset estimation, uh, algorithm in your system for a scenario where there is an unsynchronized sensor, we definitely see an improvement in the performance of our uh, of overall system. And that was the main reason why we uh, uh, introduced time offset as part of VIO state. Uh, in our case, it is slightly better than the traditional time offset uh, estimation because we are also using depth measurement for doing the uh, uh, modeling the time offset estimation in the whole system. So that's the added benefit in our system. All right, thank you. Uh, looking at additional questions, I cannot see any. Um, so thank you again. Uh, and we will now move uh, to our last speaker. Uh, it's uh, Alejo Concha Belenga. Uh, hello. So um, while you are setting up your sharing the screen, um, uh, Alejo is a computer vision engineer from Facebook. Um, he's working on technology for Oculus uh, VR, uh, the headsets and on mobile AR experiences. And before joining Facebook, he was working as a PhD student under the supervision of Professor uh, Ravia Chivera. So he's looking at SLAM systems, 3D reconstruction and sensor fusion. And today he's going to present his work uh, entitled Instant Visual Odometry for Initialization for Mobile AR. So Alejo, yeah. you can start and I can see your screen. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and everyone for attending this presentation about our recent work on Instant Visual Odometry Initialization for Mobile AR. I am Alejo Concha and these are, these are the co-authors of the paper, Michael Burry, Jesus Viales, Christian Foster and Luke Off. We all are uh, computer vision engineers working at Oculus, uh, uh, working on tracking technologies for VR headsets and also for mobile AR experiences. So uh, this is the motivation of our paper. Why is instant initialization uh, useful for mobile AR? Um, first, let me clarify that we are addressing the problem of world log AR experiences. This means that the world is logged and we have to place the AR effect in it. To achieve this goal, we need to estimate six of, uh, the six of pose of the camera of the phone with respect to a map of the world, which is also estimated simultaneously and in real time. Many AR experiences are very short in nature and users rapidly browse through different AR effects. So for this reason, it will be very problematic if we could then initialize the effect instantaneously. However, the main problem of visual odometries, which are used for to solve this problem, uh, and VIO pipelines, is that they do take some time to initialize as they need the phone to be moved, normally a few centimeters. This problem motivates our work, and we have developed a visual odometry that doesn't need to initialize. It doesn't need the phone to be moved to, for initialization. So the there are multiple options for visual automated initialization in the literature, which, which can be divided in two main classes, the ones using indirect methods and the ones using, the ones using direct methods. We are going to explain why these state-of-the-art approaches are not really useful for us. In indirect methods, in the left part of the uh, slide, you can see that some features are extracted and matched between two camera views, and then an essential matrix or a homography is estimated using the feature correspondences. This presents some problems, but the most evident one is that the initialization is not instantaneous and therefore not really useful for us. In the right part, you see a direct method, which is better because it does initialize from the very, from the very first frame. 
In this method, in this method, a random map or custom map is, is initialized and is used to estimate the system of parameters of the camera. Then, the new camera poses are used to refine the map, hoping for an eventual convergence of both the map and the camera pose. Hence, the problem here is that the initial map can be very inaccurate, and that can potentially lead to run results uh, in both the camera pose estimation and the final map. So this approach is also not really useful for us. For us. Uh, why is visual odometry initialization hard? This is because of few rotations. So as you can see in the left part of the image, uh, the phone has been rotated. And in this case, we cannot estimate depth of the features or tra the translation of the device. On the other hand, if the device translates, moves a few centimeters from left, from, from left to right, for example, as you can see in the right part of the image, then we can estimate translation and depth of the features. Our proposal uh, naturally uh, moves from the left part of the image to the right part. So initially, we don't estimate translation. And then as depth becomes available, uh, we estimate translation. This is our proposal to solve the problem we have mentioned before. First, we use a 2D 2D tracker to get feature correspondences between frames. The 2D tracker also estimates the depth of the features once the camera pose is estimated. In the estimation part, our goal is to estimate the system of pose of the current frame with respect to a previous keyframe. So our goal is to estimate the rotation R, the, the translation direction U, and the magnitude of the, of the translation S. And in this slide, I will explain how we estimate these parameters. So first, we estimate the, the relative rotation and translation direction, R and U, using a, a relative pose estimator. The relative pose estimator are, are independent of the scene, so they are independent of the map and the, and the translation of the device. The input of these estimators are feature correspondences. After that, we estimate the translation magnitude, S. For this, we, we basically minimize the representation error of the features, and, and we use a classical approach for that. We just do nonlinear optimization. The input of this approach are the feature correspondences, but also the rotation and translation direction that were estimated in the previous uh, estimation solver. In the left part of the figure, you can see how the camera views are very close. This happens during the initial frames of the, of the motion. In this case, we cannot estimate depth and we assume constant depth for all the features. In the red part of the figure, we already have some translation and then we can start to estimate uh, the depth of some of the features. In that case, the depth of the, of the features is used for the estimation of the translation magnitude. So as I said before, the direct methods initialize a, a ground map, but we also initialize a, a ground map because we, initial, we assume that the depth, of, the depth of the features are constant uh, during the initial frames. So one could think that we should have the same limitations as direct methods. However, direct methods sometimes will not work well because the initial ground map is used to estimate all the parameters of the camera, propagating the error from the map to all the, camera, to all the motion parameters. On the other hand, in our case, we don't have this problem because the ground map is only used to estimate the magnitude of the, of the translation. The rotation and the translation direction are always, are always correct as they don't depend on the map. Apart from that, during the initial frames when depth is unknown, it doesn't really matter if the translation magnitude is wrong because its estimated value is very close to zero, which means that the user is not, is not going to perceive uh, this super small error and also it is not going to be uh, present in, the, in our estimation either. In this slide, we compare the standard uh, bundle adjustment estimation against our approach. By bundle, by bundle adjustment here, I mean that we do structure based bundle adjustment. So we only estimate the camera pose and we fix the, the, the 3D points. We do this comparison uh, to reflect. Uh, um, our uh, our context, which and our context is the initial frames of uh, of the motion of the camera. In this context, we don't have a map because we cannot estimate it, as I said before. So we compare our approach against the six of six of uh, standard estimator when the map is unknown. 
And as you can see, our estimator uh, is clearly better uh, than the system estimator when depth is not available. When depth is, is available, then the errors are pretty similar. In the right part of the image, uh, you can see a comparison also against the standard set of estimator when depth is not available. So as you can see in this case, our error, the red and blue lines are bounded with, with the number of frames. So here in the x-axis, you can see uh, the number of frames and the y-axis, you can see our error. The bundle adjustment optimization, the standard system of estimator has an error that linearly increases with the number of frames. So this is a very important result that shows that our approach is very convenient for the initial frames. As I, as I said before, we use a relative post estimator to estimate translation direction u and, and rotation r. Normally, in, relative, in the relative post estimator problem, we minimize a functional, which is xc, XC transpose in this case, where x is the, are the motion parameters stuck in a vector, and c are the input data from the building vectors. In the, in, the, in the literature, there are two main approaches to solve this problem the quadratic LA constraint quadratic program QCQP and the nonlinear iterative optimization. In our case, we have chosen nonlinear optimization because of its efficiency and, and because of its low binary size uh, when you use a library in C. The problem of uh, nonlinear optimization is that uh, we are minimizing a functional that is one dimensional and we are optimizing five parameters. So we don't have enough. Uh, so the residual is not big enough for the parameters we are estimating. To solve this problem, we follow the trick from Knipe and Linen uh, in their paper where they, what, what, and what, they, what they do is to minimize the Jacobians of the function. So by doing that, they minimize five parameters. Uh, they, they, sorry, they uh, minimize, uh, they optimize five parameters and therefore the, the size of the function is the same as the number of the parameters. However, in our experiments, we realize that minimizing the Jacobians is not great because we found convergence issues when the initial state is not good. And we added to the functional, to the residual also the, the functional itself. So, so we combine the Jacobians and the functional and we get better results as we saw in the paper. So these are the contributions of our paper. We have implemented a visual odometry without initialization by proposing a post estimator that decouples the sys of pose to estimate into two parts, the five dof relative pose and the translation magnitude. Uh, our six dof post estimator outperforms structure-based bundle adjustment solutions when depth is not observable. Also, our five dof relative post estimator outperforms state-of-the-art solutions for the relative pose problem. We release a data set for the relative pose problem, as you can see in the paper. And finally, we have integrated our results in mobile devices. Our approach is currently used in Facebook and Instagram apps. As you will see in the next slide, where I'm going to show a, a video of our approach. In the first part of the video, you will see an effect, uh, an AR effect, a dog that, that uh, appears when we press the button. And as you can see, it's instantaneously initialized from the very first frame. And and we can initialize it uh, with any kind of motion. So here we saw few rotations, we saw translations, we saw backwards and forward motion. And as you can see, the method is successful for any kind of motion. And in the second part of the video, I will show uh, uh, that our approach can also work in a long trajectory, in this case, around the table. The blue square in the image is a, is a air effect, a very simple air effect. And as you can see here, the white trajectory aligns very well. Sorry, the, the red trajectory aligns very well with the white trajectory. Uh, the white trajectory is ground truth, and the red trajectory is the trajectory that our method estimates. So, in that, this is uh, actually accurate also in long trajectories. Yeah, and this is it. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Valero, for this uh, nice presentation. Um, yes, uh, now you can ask questions. Um, you can raise your hand or put the question in the chat. I'm looking at the chat. 
no question in the chat. Okay, so people are shy today. Uh, I would have a question. For, maybe you can stop the screen sharing. Hi. Yes, I, I think your um, your paper is very interesting because it solves a problem of many many uh, tracking systems or SLAM systems that you cannot start doing the augmented uh, the augmentation from the very first uh, slide. Now. Um, probably you face the same problem also as others that you cannot compute the scale of the scene so uh, if you put an object you will just have a, a, a standard scale so do you see how you could um, or what you could add or work on to try to get a, a scene scale to, in order to get this uh, ar effects according to the scale of the scene yeah yeah so this is a problem that we are not solving in, in this research so we basically, what we basically do is to initialize a, a random scale that normally that fits the image, like that, yeah, where we can place the effect more or less like in a percentage of the image. Uh, if I have to work on this problem, I, I think it is a problem that you cannot solve uh, using standard approaches, uh, using standard computer vision approaches. Probably I will use machine learning to try to uh, find objects in the scene, uh, objects that you know the size of. Uh, for example, if you detect a table, then you know that the approximate size of the table, and then you can use that as a prior for the scale. Uh, it, it will not be super accurate, but, uh, but it is something that you can use to at least have a decent scale, I, th I think. Well, thanks. Um, we still have time for questions. So uh, if someone wants to ask a question, don't hesitate. Looking at the chat and the Q and A. So, uh, are you planning to uh, to open source your code, or will it be available in Facebook uh, products? Yeah. Uh, so for now, uh, I think I will wait and to see uh, how it uh, impacts in the community. I mean, if there are multiple people that would like to use this code for the research. Then I, uh, I will consider open sourcing it. Uh, it will take, uh, I think, quite a while to do that. Uh, but yeah, I will happy to do it if I see that there is interest. Um, so we know what we have to do. We have to tell you our interest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we share it. OK. Um, I don't see any other question in the chat. Um, so. Um, we have, uh, in theory, three minutes to ask any questions to all the presenters, uh, if you have some. Uh, I would also like uh, to take the opportunity to thank again all the presenters for the nice presentations. And um, after this session on Zoom, uh, we will continue with the presenters in Gaza Town. Uh, there is a dedicated room, uh, Q&A, uh, with the sub rooms the private space where you can discuss directly with the authors so uh, you just have to follow the convention so it's the rooms a.1 to a.5 for the presenters in the order of the presentation and if you want to uh, to go in uh, gaza town and find it easily you can uh, locate me or um, michel uh, gatulo and just click on follow him so your avatar will automatically go to uh, the room. Okay, um, so in, there's uh, no other question. So uh, I would like to thank you all again for participating, for uh, listening to uh, these presentations. Thanks to all the presenters and see you in a couple of minutes in Gaza Town. <laughs>